Hi, I'm Chris Rosanovich. I'm co-founder and chief architect at Sci5. Today, I'm going to take you through Sci5's journey, starting with the projects at UC Berkeley that led to Sci5's formation, and continuing on to the present day, four and a half years later. The story of Sci5 really starts with the RISC-V project at UC Berkeley. In 2010, as part of the Parallel Computing Laboratory, or Parlab project, we decided we needed to pick an instruction set around which to base our computer architecture research and implementation work. The obvious choices would have been x86 and ARM, as these are both well-supported application ISAs. However, they're also both very complex, and both come with severe IP entanglements that meant we wouldn't have been able to share any cores we built with our colleagues in academia. We eventually decided that we should build a, a new clean slate open ISA that was simple, efficient, and extensible to support our research into application-specific processes. The principal architects uh, behind RISC V were Andrew Waterman and Yun Sub Lee, who were both graduate students at the time, Dave Patterson and myself, although many others helped along the way. We optimistically imagined this would only take three months, but it actually took four years before we felt comfortable freezing the design. During those four years, we did many implementations, including ports of compilers and operating systems, and you could continue to refine the design and publish papers on the research around the core design. It's important to note that RISC-V was never meant to be a research deliverable, um, but rather the infrastructure we needed to do other research. One note is the name is pronounced RISC-V as it represents the fifth generation of RISC design from UC Berkeley. Dave Patterson coined the term RISC when leading the original Berkeley RISC projects, but regrets not staying with the name after RISC-2. So we went and posthumously renamed Swore and Spur to RISC-3 and RISC-4, which is why the new ISA is called RISC-V. The very first RISC-V implementation, Raven 1, was on a 28 nanometer FDSOI process technology from ST Microelectronics. But unlike the earlier Berkeley RISC projects, there was not just one tape out of RISC-V, but now there have been very many. At Berkeley, we didn't just develop RISC-V cores, we also developed a complete open source SOC generator we called Rocketchip. Rocketchip contains a library of components, including processors, caches, coherence managers, interconnect, and I.O. devices. And Rocketchip is highly configurable and parameterizable, supporting a great deal of research and experimentation. You can uh, modify parameters, develop new accelerators, develop your own RISC-V core, or develop your own device uh, in the process of assembling an entire SOC. Uh, Rocketchip is now maintained by Sci-5 with the Chips Alliance, but is widely used in academia and other companies. Rockets even be used uh, to develop commercial products. We couldn't have developed a SOC generator as powerful as Rocketchip using industry standard HDL, such as Verilog and VHDL. We'd actually developed our own new hardware description language called Chisel. So Chisel is actually embedded in a high-level programming language, Scala, and it gives hardware designers a full flexibility of building very highly parameterized generators, yet still having complete control down to the register and MUX level of what is emitted in the RTL. And Chisel makes it easy to write a design once and then generate different versions of Verilog, either for simulation or for FPGA prototyping or for ASIC synthesis. The power of the Chisel language enables to build a very large library of reusable components in Rocketchip. And this enabled a small team of grad students to build many, many quite complicated SOCs that were used uh, for various research projects. So we would combine RISC-V processors and interconnects with other analog mixed signal components, for example, integrated silicon photonics or on-chip uh, DC-DC converters in various research projects. And to date, we've completed many, many SLC designs, all based on RISC-V, Chisel, and Rocketchip. By 2014, we realized there was actually a lot of external interest in RISC-V. And so in the summer of 2014, we got a booth at Hot Chips conference in Stanford, and we made up a whole bunch of uh, artifacts, including these blue t-shirts, and we descended en masse to evangelize RISC-V to the community at the Hot Chips conference. We were very, very surprised at the very positive feedback we received there. There were many people saying this was exactly the kind of thing they'd been looking for, and they're explaining to us their trials and tribulations with the current industry uh, status quo. After the reception at Hot Chips, we decided to hold a series of RISC-V workshops out of Berkeley and invited everybody to come along. 
And the first few workshops, they all sold out completely, and there was a strong enthusiasm around RISC V. However, the industry folks said that in order for them to build on this and to be able to depend on it, the project needed to move out of Berkeley into a more permanent home. And so in August of 2015, uh, Rick O'Connor joined as executive director, founding director, and we created the RISC V Foundation as a stable place to house the instruction set specifications and to build and promote the ISA. And today, the foundation is thriving, growing very strongly, and the many, many well-known names are now members of the RISC-V Foundation. Here's just a quick slide showing you a scatter plot of all the various member logos. And really, the membership of the foundation includes companies ranging from foundries through SOC, developers, suppliers, core IP suppliers, uh, software vendors, and end users, all working together to help promote RISC-V as an open standard. Now let's get back to Sci-5. So we developed all this technology at Berkeley, uh, RISC-V, Chisel, Rocket Chip, and it's clear there's a lot of potential to use this to help solve real industry problems. Now Yonsup, he was very keen to do a startup. I remember talking to him and he was very anxious to do something out in industry, do some kind of startup. Wasn't clear what exactly. And he was going around talking to investors. And at that time, it was incredibly difficult to get funding in the semiconductor industry. Basically, uh, as he talked to different VCs, the more they knew about semiconductors, the faster they said no. And I think actually his record for a conversation was uh, going out to an investor and asking, hey, I'm Yun Sup Lee, I'm interested in doing a startup in semiconductors. And the investor basically said, no thanks, goodbye, and left. Now, um, so next chain in the process was, uh, while this was going on, uh, one of my other ex-students, mine and Dave's ex-student, Shang Jitan, was working at Pure Storage, designing uh, one of their flash storage arrays. And the recruiter at Sutter Hill, who was also funding Pure, um, asked Zhangji for the name of some good students at Berkeley. And so he managed to cough up the names of Andrew and Yunsup, the Sci-5 co-founders. So when Doug called Yunsup to try and recruit him to Pure, uh, Yunsup replied, I have a much better idea. And this is really how Sci-5 got started. Um, Doug came up to Berkeley, visited us at the Bears Industrial Liaison Conference, and was quite interested in RISC-V for the data center. Uh, we had a Firebox project based around uh, RISC-V in the data center. Um, however, it wasn't until really Stefan Dickeroff came up from Sutter Hill and spent a long afternoon in Berkeley, where we really formed, and this was really the formative day where we really decided that there is a big project here and we should go do the Sci-5 as a startup. Things moved quite quickly after that initial meeting with Stefan. And by middle of summer, we had a term sheet from Sutter Hill and um, we went straight to Series A with this seed round of uh, seed funding of $5 million um, from Sutter Hill. And to be honest, we didn't actually have a pitch deck or really had completely figured out our business model at the time, but Stefan had great faith in us. And I got to thank him greatly for showing so much faith in uh, the team at the very beginning. I thought it'd be fun to include some photos of the early days of Sci-5, and here's a photo of uh, Yunsup and Andrew uh, signing the paperwork to incorporate Sci-5. They're actually sitting at my dining table at home, it's strewn with my kids' toys as we go through all the legalities of setting up the company. For the rest of 2015, we really worked on what is the business model? How is the company going to operate? What is this product going to be? What are we going to do? And we just did this mainly out of... Uh, an office at Sutter Hill, we were entrepreneurs in residence there in Palo Alto, and this was quite a productive uh, initial few months as we figured everything out. In all of our discussions, we kept coming back to the same point, that we really saw this big sea change in the semiconductor industry, really this emergence of a vertical semiconductor business model. So what we see is large chip customers, instead of being happy with standard products, really wanted their own custom differentiated chip designs. And so some examples of this are how Apple, Samsung, and Huawei High Silicon build their own silicon for phones. They don't sell the chips, but they sell the phones. Uh, or the hyperscalers, Google, Amazon, Microsoft, Alibaba, um, they're building chips to put in their cloud services. And they don't really sell the chips, they sell the service that the chips enable. Um, also automotive, Tesla, Waymo, these are companies that are building uh, uh, self-driving autonomous vehicles. And these advanced automobiles, again, the goal is not to sell the chip, it's to sell the car. And the real idea here is that the end system value justifies this chip NRE. So if you're a company with an important product and you know that silicon is going to increase the value of that product, custom silicon, you're motivated to go do that chip design. 
Now, this is fine if you're a very big company, but what about the smaller companies, even just a firm that's not a huge firm, what has a great idea, wants to build a better product that relies on custom silicon, but they can't really afford the chip uh, non-recurring engineering costs, the NRE. So that was really something we wanted to focus in on, is making sci 5 b a virtual chip design team that would take all our advances in chip design productivity, uh, user is five, and really do for chip design what the foundries have done for fabs. So we wanted sci 5 to be a company that builds customized RISC-V based SOCs for our customers using all that technology that came out of Berkeley. We set out looking for an office and found one in San Francisco near AT&T Park and that supported commute by both Bart and Caltrain. Initially we had no furniture, so here you see the early team members carrying in folding tables and chairs from my house to use before the main furniture arrived. Here's the very first meeting in the new office discussing the proposed new RISC-5 debug spec. Uh, to make the transition from university research to commercial product, we had to add all the features that industry users expected in our cores, and debug was the first new standard we pushed to be developed at the RISC-V Foundation. The real desks and chairs eventually arrived, and we managed to recruit the initial members of the team. Uh, so soon we were busy developing our first RISC-V microcontroller SOC. Our plan had been to focus on SOCs, but we really did not have the luxury of being a stealth startup. It seemed everyone had heard about RISC-V and sci 5 we had many companies coming to us asking for RISC V cores. Initially, we said, we don't do that. Please just help yourself to the open source cores. However, after more than a handful of companies came by, we realized as a startup, we should listen to the market demand. And so we decided to begin selling RISC V core IP. Our strategic goals in this decision were to make it easier for everyone to use RISC V so we could grow the whole RISC V ecosystem. And also it would gain us early access to large semiconductor accounts. And of course, we'd also start getting revenue and customer validation, which is also critical for a startup. Our first customer was Microsemi, now part of Microchip. They asked for an open source RISC-V 32-bit soft core to map to their FPGA. They also wanted a very fast turnaround as they had their own customer waiting for this. We decided to set aside our own SOC project and go full steam ahead to deliver this to Microsemi. And we managed to complete the core on a very aggressive schedule, and Microsemi was happy with the result. Based on the success of this project, uh, we managed to secure a much larger second project, providing a 64-bit RISC-V quad-core applications processor with custom real-time features to be hardened as part of the Polarfire SOC, which Microsip just announced last December at the RISC-V Summit. We're very grateful to the folks at Microchip who gave a small and proven startup these initial contracts. The team was growing, but still small, and we were trying to tape out our first SOC within six months of the first engineers joining the company. In this period, we also had to build our servers and get access to CAD tool licenses and IP, a very painful process. We had a very tight deadline to hit tape out in time to have development boards ready before the next risc workshop. Uh, we spent the money to accelerate our lots, and Yunsup actually flew to Taiwan to hand carry some wafers back to the US. He had a very interesting evening trying to bring the wafers through US customs with missing paperwork. Um, fortunately, the chip came up very quickly, and we managed to get from wafers out of fab in Taiwan to having High Five One Deb boards up for sale in just 13 days. And that was just in time to start selling these at the fifth RISC V workshop in November. One of the main motivations for sci 5 to produce development boards is to stimulate the software ecosystem. sci 5 can't possibly port all the necessary software to RISC-5, and we have to rely on the open source and commercial software communities to help bring up all the software needed to make RISC-5 useful in real products. The second chip we developed was much more ambitious than the first microcontroller SLC and was intended to drive the Linux software ecosystem for RISC-5. The Freedom Unleashed 540 would contain a quad 64-bit cache coherent application processor cluster, a DDR controller, a GigaNet Ethernet port, and a coherent chip-to-chip -chip link based on our open tiling standard, which we added to enable our customers to prototype their own RTL on an FPGA connected to the Unleash board over this link. We taped the chip out in late 2017, the first silicon came back working fine, and we had boards ready for sale in February 2018. 
Surprisingly, the Hi5 Unleash board is still the only commercial board that's been produced capable of booting a full RISC-5 Linux distribution, but we've actually sold out of our limited production run. Uh, though Microchip has recently announced their Polifier SLC will soon be available, and that includes an updated version of the Sci-5 U54MC core complex, but now integrated with more peripherals and FPGA fabric on a single die. To illustrate the importance of having real boards to drive the software ecosystem, here's a plot from Debian, showing how rapidly Debian Linux packages are ported to RISC-V. The rapidly ascending line shows how within a few months of having the Unleash boards, the Debian team managed to port tens of thousands of packages to RISC-V, and now RISC-V is actually better supported than PowerPC or Itanium in Linux. There are still some holes in the RISC-V software ecosystem, but they're being filled at a rapid clip. Fast forward to Sci-5 today, and we have built a large and talented executive team to run the company. After our Series B round, we could finally afford to recruit a real CEO. And Naveed Chowani, who we met when he'd been called in by a VC to help with due diligence on us, was far and away the best candidate. His earlier experience at creating Intel Microelectronics, Open Silicon, and several other startups, together with his passion for open source and education, made him the obvious choice. One of David's early strategic moves was to acquire his old startup, Open Silicon, which gave Sci-5 instant access to a large, experienced team with hundreds of custom SOC tapeouts and many millions of chip shipments under their belt. We're also fortunate that many other experienced technology executives are also excited by the prospects for custom RISC V Silicon and have joined the Sci-5 team. Sci-5 has managed to rapidly develop multiple families of RISC-V processes, spanning the performance range from tiny two-stage in-order pipeline embedded cores to high-frequency 12-stage out-of-order superscalar application processes, and now has by far the widest range of RISC-V IP of any vendor. This rapid development exploits the power chisel and the rocket ship libraries, which cuts our development costs dramatically compared with industry standard processor development approaches. Each of our core families is also highly configurable, providing an even wider range of core types. Anyone can try customizing their own core using our web-based core designer by visiting sci5.com. The core IP is supplemented with extensive Sci5 Sci Shield security IP and Sci5 Insight integrated trace and debug. We've seen great demand and market acceptance of Sci5 RISC-V core IP. Uh, we now have over 150 commercial design wins for our cores from over 70 different companies, and we see strong demand, especially for higher performance cores. There are a few of our customers we can share that have reached production silicon. Uh, Wami is using our cores in a wearable SOC, um, and Fadu is using an embedded multi-core inside an award-winning high-performance SSD controller. As we've already discussed, Microchip is using an application processor cluster in the Polifier SLC. These demonstrate the wide range of applications in which RISC-V is being deployed today. Cores are far from being the only IP components in any SLC. We've also been cultivating an IP ecosystem we call DesignShare to better allow our SLC customers easy access to third-party IP suppliers and vice versa. We're also investing in developing or acquiring more of our own IP where it makes sense. For example, IP that is likely to be widely used by many of our customer projects. We are building Sci-5 as an integrated full-stack SOC company that allows customers to come into our SOC flow at any point in the design and manufacturing process. Yeah, we're really seeing true synergies after the open silicon acquisition. Uh, RISC-5 IP has been attracting customers to Sci-5, and in some cases they're now contemplating doing the silicon design with us also. Uh, conversely, some customers who come in with silicon projects are now considering swapping their current processes for RISC-5 IP. Sci-5 has grown remarkably in this last four and a half years. We now have offices around the world and nearly 600 employees worldwide. This growth has been driven by strong demand for RISC-V custom silicon and RISC-V IP. Uh, we are still growing and we are still privately held. Uh, we were recently humbled and honored to receive the GSA's Most Respected Private Semiconductor Company Award two years in a row. Um, our goal and mission still remains the same. We want to help reduce the cost and risk of chip development so we can democratize access to custom silicon and hopefully drive a new wave of hardware-based innovation in our industry. Thank you.